Good evening. We're really glad you've joined us tonight. Um, for those of you who may have be joining us for the first time, we play those two songs, More Than Conquerors and In Need, simply because every Wednesday we've been working on, before the uh, pandemic, we've been working on these two songs, and we'll continue to work on those, learning them, uh, learning the music and things like that. So uh, we've just kind of kept that tradition going for this study. We're glad that you're here. Uh, very quickly, we want you to know, uh, we praise God that Brian Wonder is home. Uh, Brian and Christy are doing well, and we're still praying for his recovery. Also, um, some of you may have just found out, too, that um, Brother Chris Pollard, uh, one of our shepherds, lost his father. Uh, he passed away uh, Monday morning, and so um, our sympathy goes to uh, Chris and his family. His name was Terry Pollard, and um, our condolences to the family. Uh, just a reminder that if you are still in need or are in need now of communion supplies or uh, you want a physical bu bulletin or one of the uh, handouts that we have that we use or anything like that, please come by the office. You can call the office and just set up a time and Drew will have those things ready for you. Uh, we have lots of people coming by now, now that we're several weeks into this thing. So Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursdays between 9 and 2. Also, um, we want all of you to know that we have a stocked pantry, and so um, please let us know. You can call the office. You can let me know. I can meet you up there privately, or you can come by, however you want to do that. And um, uh, if, the other thing would be to call Lynn Ward, and he will assist you. And so please let us know on that. If you, if you need uh, anything from that pantry, um, or if you know of a family member of yours or a friend of yours or a neighbor, we're happy to help during this time. So please let us know about that. Tonight, we're going to continue on in our um, living a balanced Christian life. And so I'm going to hold this up here and you're going to get to see, let's see here if I can hold it up in a way that you can see it pretty well. Okay, so you'll notice here that we've got uh, Christ as the center and then we have three of the spokes filled in. For tonight. Tonight will be the third spoke, and God's Word is one of those. Prayer and worship is the other spoke, as well as tonight is fellowship. So go ahead and write fellowship on one of those spokes, and then you can fill in number five down here for fellowship, Acts 2, 42, and 1 John. So Christ Jesus being the hub, we've been talking about a balanced Christian life. And so let's jump right into our study. Turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 2 as we begin. <clears throat> we'll be there in just a minute. Let me recap very quickly. Um, if you would like to have your life where it is a balanced life, where it's not a roller coaster of a life, in other words, you have good spiritual times, uh, things seemingly are going pretty well for you, or, uh, and then you have other times where you you bottom out, you hit rock bottom, just like a roller coaster. You're hitting, you're going way down. You've got loops in it, right? Twists and turns in your life, uh, things that happen, and we can't prevent those circumstances, difficulties, pain, all that stuff. No matter what kind of a Christian life you live, you're going to have those things. But if you will live a balanced Christian life where Christ is the hub, for me to live. Is Christ and to die is gain, Philippians chapter 1 and verse 21. Then Christ Jesus will continue to provide you with strength, the power, the knowledge, the wisdom, uh, the discernment, all the things that you need to live that life well. And then, of course, holding everything together is our obedience to Him. In other words, we have a relationship with Him as our Lord, as our Master, and we want to be obedient to Him. So we find that to be Romans chapter 12 when it talks about offering our bodies as a living and holy sacrifice to the Lord and, of course, keeping His commandments. And so that's the idea of the realm, if you will, that holds everything together. And then, of course, if you don't have God's Word put in there, if God's Word is not a part of your life, Jesus can't be the hub, by the way. It all messes up. Jesus Christ is the Word, John 1. The Word became flesh, John 1 and verse 14. Um, Jesus is the uh, image of the invisible God, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 15. And so 
when we put all that together, if we want to know God, we've got to know Jesus. If we want to know Jesus, we've got to know the Word. We have to stay in the Word of God. So that's one of the spokes. Otherwise, it's going to be that roller coaster stuff again. And there's going to be very stressful, dark, depressing times, and then times that are okay, but not like they should be, because these spokes have to be in place. And then last week, prayer and worship, and that's that idea like we talked about last week. And thank you so much for your great comments on things of you reaching out and, um, and your encouragement on it. But we talked about prayer and worship and that idea of when we see God, we worship. When we see God, we pray. We don't do the opposite, though. Charles Hodge talks about that, that we don't worship and then see God. We don't pray and then see God. And you know what I mean by see him, right? That's that idea of experiencing him, um, having that relationship with him, knowing him and things. Um, and when we elevate God in our life, when Jesus is the center, when he's the hub, surrounded by obedience, we're in the Word of God. We're not just reading the Word of God, but we're studying the Word of God. And I can't wait to get all back together on Wednesday nights because we're going to pick up right where we left off on um, uh, how to study the Bible. And by the way, just a little plug, if you're not a part of us at Wiley, uh, we're going to keep the live stream going. And so uh, once we get back into that building and we get back to our study on Wednesday nights on how to study that Bible, how to apply, how to interpret, and things like that, then you can be... You can join us on that. You can be a part of us if you wish. And then tonight, we've added fellowship. Now, our goal tonight is to show and to talk about and discover that our like-minded fellowship is crucial to staying connected to each other and connected to God. Fellowship, koinonia, it's a beautiful word in the text, is imperative for us to grow as disciples of Jesus. There are a lot of Christians who think that they can have Jesus and not have the church. That's not how it works. Go back to Ephesians 1, go to Colossians 1, and you start discovering that Christ is the head of the body. We are the body of Christ. He came to set up a, a, a spiritual kingdom, not a physical one, but a spiritual one, in order that we might be a part of that. You read Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12, and you discover how everyone, every Christian is vital for the body to be healthy. And if a member of that body is suffering, then the whole body suffers. And so it's crucial that we talk about fellowship. Now, some of you are going to hear things that we've been talking about already because we just took a whole study, a six-lesson series on 1 John, which has to do with if we want fellowship with God to be right, fellowship with man has to be right, and vice versa. And so um, he starts out in that uh, great letter, John starts out and he says this in 1 John 1 and verse 3. We'll be in Acts 2 in a minute. But here's what he says. He starts out the letter this way. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also, so that you may have fellowship, koinonia, with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. You know what? As you read First John, what dawns on you and what you kind of realize is um, that fellowship is not a meal that we eat. Fellowship is, uh, eating is a part of fellowship. We're going to see that next too, but we've called it a fellowship meal and we've done ourselves a little bit of a disservice, haven't we? We've done ourselves a disservice by attaching koinonia, the concept, to a shared meal and that being all that's wrapped up in fellowship with God and with each other, really. And that's, that's not biblical. Biblically speaking, fellowship is a joint sharing. It is a partnership in the gospel of Christ and in Christ, of living life, worshiping, eating, fun, study, trials, doing all that stuff together. It's a common 
sharing, and it's displayed in Acts chapter 2. So, fellowship is an important, it's a vital spoke, it's a vital role in our lives as Christians. And the folks who go, you know what, I can do my Christianity at home, then they're going to, their will, so to speak, is going to be wobbly because it's going to be, your life is going to be unbalanced. Things are not going to be right because we have to have that connection. Paul long, longed for that connection. You can read it in his letters. He has a longing to be together. The Lord's Supper is a part of that. Worship, the Lord's Supper, praying and singing, doing all of those things together as the body of Christ is so vital. I love what Tony Evans wrote one time. It just makes for a great illustration. He said, ant hills are made when a bunch of insignificant creatures get together. If you ever mistakenly step on an ant hill without shoes, their fellowship will make an impact on you. One ant bite might sting a little. Most folks can handle that, he says. But if a person messes with the whole family in an ant hill, those ants will gather around your foot and serve notice that you are unwelcomed in their house. One ant can't create that kind of impact by itself. Gathered together, their combined effect is much greater, he says. Not only do they ward off intruders together, they also work together to rebuild in a day and a half what was destroyed. And so I just think that if you now you get in your mind this concept of uh, an ant hill and ants, and of course Proverbs talks about uh, ants and how they work, but you know, down here in Texas, not so much in, uh, you know, central Oklahoma and northern Oklahoma where we're from, but down here in Texas, you guys know ants, you know fire ants, and you know how fast they'll build a mound. After you mow it over, they'll have that back up in the evening because they work together. And you also know that if you are working in your flower bed and you have to put your hand in an ant mound, those ants will let you know that you're not welcome there right? In other words, you're their enemy and they want you out. The best thing that we can do is have a strong koinonia, a sweet, sweet fellowship of like-minded believers, all working for the same cause, all working inside of the blood of Jesus, from the blood of Jesus, from his church, the body, and then we can ward off the enemy and we can build a, you know, build on to that spiritual kingdom like Christ has commissioned us to do in Matthew chapter 28. And so fellowship is a very biblical concept and it's part of the balance as a Christian. So we ask ourselves, what's the basis of fellowship? We already read it, 1 John 1 and verse 3, that we might have fellowship, that you might have fellowship with us. And indeed our fellowship was with the Father. We have a joint sharing, a common bond with the Father and with his son, Jesus Christ. If you look at our world today, then you're going to know that um, the world even has aspects, different basis on which they rest their fellowship. If you start thinking about different things that they, people come together to do, things that unite them into a common sharing, okay? Uh, let me just name some worldly things like that. One thing that a lot of you guys and a lot of you girls too are missing are your sports teams, right? Your team, uh, it, it might be the, uh, it might be football or baseball or basketball or all the, you know, s soccer or whatever it is. But those guys and those girls, they build a fellowship together. And you take a university, they'll build a team from guys and girls all over the world will come together on this one team. And while they have nothing basically maybe culturally in common, they have this one joint sharing and it's that sport and it's to win that game and to build a camaraderie. That's what fellowship is. It's just on a spiritual basis. Companies do the same thing. 
If you've got a great company, a great CEO, the boss of that company, the creator of that company will try to build a fellowship within it. The military does the same thing to try to build the fellowship with guys, a camaraderie that you have a joint sharing. We're all after the same task together. And so you take the military concept and you think those guys are put together, they live together, they eat together, they struggle together, a lot of them learn things together, they're trained together, they fight together, they defend together. Is that not the same way with the kingdom of God? But if we're not trying to be a part of that, and if you're not trying to be a part of that in your local fellowship, then that fellowship of believers is not as strong as it needs to be because you're not a part of it. So as we look at Acts 2, I know you've read this a lot, but let's read it again. You've probably studied it a lot, but we're going to start in verse 42 and discuss this a little bit. Acts 2 and verse 42. Luke records this. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. So what are the four things that are mentioned that the early church continued in, right? The four things, the apostles' teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread. There's a lot of good uh, reasons for, if you study this, there's a lot of good reasons to think that that would be uh, continuing in the Lord's Supper because he talks about common bread just a few verses later, okay? Um, and so, and in the Greek text, I'm pretty sure this has an article in it, breaking of the bread, and then to prayer. So the four things, teaching, fellowship, Lord's Supper, and to prayer. If koinonia, if fellowship means a common sharing, how do you think they shared in all these things in their daily life in the early church? Well, we actually have a glimpse of that if you read on in verse 43 and following. Acts 2, 43. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. Verse 44, all the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and their goods, they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. And so what other things do you see here that proved their common bond together? Okay, first of all, they were, they were all very joyful, filled with awe, and they were astounded by the signs that the apostles were doing. So that tells us something. What does it tell us? That the church remained around those apostles a lot. Okay, so you mark that down. All of these believers, you know, when you come to faith in Christ Jesus and you give your life over to Christ and that faith, generally speaking, is an all-encompassing word. Believe or faith is the same Greek word in the original language. And that's the concept of when you obey the gospel, when you do the things that Christ Jesus has commissioned us to do, then that is faith, okay? Same with Noah in his day. God told him to build an ark. Everything involved in listening to God and doing what God said, okay? That was faith, Hebrews 11. And so as these people of faith, these Christians, later to become Christians, Acts 11, they had everything in common, okay? They were, they were doing life together. They were selling their possessions and their goods they didn't sell them all. We know they didn't sell them all because if you continue to read Luke, Luke's account of Acts, you find out that many of the Christians would invite the, the disciples and the evangelists to their homes. They didn't sell everything, but they sold stuff in order that needs could be met. There were true needs, by the way, that those who were hungry could eat, those who needed a bed could have a bed, those who needed clothing, okay? And so they shared those things. We, we're trying to do that as Christians, aren't we? Many of you are trying to do that. Today, you're trying to do that. You're trying to let your other brothers and sisters know to take care of the family of God, that if you're hungry, you come and see me. 
right? If you need stuff from Walmart, if you need stuff from the grocery store, you come and see me and we'll provide that for you. That's the common sharing. Every day, by the way, it says here in verse 46, they continue to meet together in the temple courts, studying God's word, encouraging one another. And they did it every day. By the way, getting to know one another. Not all of them knew each other. Lots of people coming together. They broke bread in their homes. Okay, so we have fellowship meals now. They did do that. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together. And they were, uh, they were very happy together. It's not because they had a bunch of stuff, though. It was because of the fellowship that they were, that they were in, in Christ Jesus, and together. Okay? Now, what I want to encourage you to do is, as you have filled in number five there, fellowship, you'll notice that the verse is Acts 2 and verse 42. I want you to internalize this. This is one of the best verses for what the early church, what the church of Jesus Christ needs to be about. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer. Now, look, I think we do okay with studying the Word of God, the apostles' teachings. We have that here, right? Studying the Word of God. I think we do pretty well in doing the Lord's Supper. We can always do that better, take more time to do it, be more intimate with it, understand what it really means. Uh, prayer, I think prayer is a... A common thing among star fellowship of believers but fellowship common sharing being in each other's lives on a physical basis and on a spiritual basis and you can't separate the two so internalize Acts 242 with your family okay let's move on a little bit further why is fellowship so important to us a couple of verses that will help us to see why fellowship is so important to us. One of them is Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25. Please turn over there with me. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25. I know you know 25 real well because we hammer that to people who are not attending church. <laughs> we discussed that on a Sunday night, though, didn't we? That uh, this is, uh, he wants you to assemble to be encouraged. He's not as telling you to... Uh, uh, encouraging you to assemble as he is. You need to be together so that you can be together for this purpose. Now, if we're keeping things in context, but I want you to notice 24. So we're in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. If you are not active in the fellowship of believers, in other words, in each other's lives on a physical basis and on a spiritual basis, then you can't be encouraging and spur me on, and I can't be encouraging to you and spur you on. And then he goes on here, be sure to not forsake meeting together so that you can do this together, right? He says, let us consider how we spur one another on toward love and good deeds, and let us not give up meeting together as some in the habit are doing, but let us encourage one another. The idea is you need this encouragement. You need to be a part of the body so that you can, some need it so that they can heal. Some need it that they can grow. Some need it so that they can, because they need to be helping others heal and others to grow and others to be more faithful to God and be an encouragement to others. Okay, another verse is Solomon uh, what, with what he talks about in Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9 through 12. I'll give you a couple of seconds to look that up. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 9 through 12. The Bible says, chapter 4, 9 Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. For if either of them falls, the one will lift up his companion. But woe to the one who falls when there is not another to lift him up. Okay, so what's the benefit of fellowship? We are stronger together. That's the benefit. Um, I want you to pause now and think about in the last four, five, six weeks, 
how much strength you have gathered from simply thinking about being a part of the body of Christ and that there are others who are going through exactly what you're going through and the strength that you have, the encouragement that you, that you gain from those brothers and sisters who have reached out to you um, and the ones that you've reached out to, we've tried to do a, a decent job of reminding you to stay connected and this is one way of doing that. I've heard from so many of you, Steve, we're not, we're not able to be with you physically, but it's so good to be able to see you. We hope you're well. We are well. We are a part of that together. And we, are, we remain strong because we know that we're going to get back to that soon. And we know that we gain that strength, prayer and camaraderie and a partnership and a sharing of trials and truth and all of these things need to be done together. Fellowship is so crucial. Okay, one more verse, and then I'm going to get to a couple of other things before I let you go tonight. 1 John 1 and verse 7. Turn over there with me. First John 1 and verse 7. This is the other scripture that I want you to internalize. You need to remember there's a difference in memorizing and internalizing. You can have a verse internalized and not have it memorized. You can have a verse memorized. You can be able to say it with your lips, word for word, but not have it internalized. The idea is, as David would say time and time again, I love your word, I delight in your word, and I meditate on it day and night. That's internalizing it. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship, koinonia, with one another. So important. See, how, how do we have fellowship with one another? Because we're all walking in light. And when I walk in the light, when my journey is in the light, and by the way, yes, there are times that I fall and I trip and I step out, but I come back. But see, a step is not my journey. The step is not my walk. I step out, I sin, I fall, but I stay in the light. I come right back to the light and I remain in fellowship with you and in fellowship with the Lord. And, and you know what happens? The blood of Jesus, his son cleanses us from all of our sins and it's a continual action. So my fellowship is my walk with the Lord and it's my walk with you. That's how important fellowship is. And as kindly as I know how to do it, if you are not personally, intimately involved in the body of Christ, and when I say intimate, I'm talking about on a deep level. That's the idea. On a deep level, in other words, you have relationships with the body of Christ, with those in the body then your life cannot and will not be balanced. There will always be something missing for you. And you'll always have that thought. And you need to know it's because you're not active in the body of Christ. Okay, so I'm going to say a couple of harder things to you, but just know that I love you as I say them, okay? I want to give you about nine things or so that will hinder your Christian fellowship. With one another. This is not on the outline. If you want to flip your sheet over and write these down real fast, I want to kind of end with this, okay? About nine things. Let me see here. I put six things, but I'm pretty sure there's more than that. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, there's eight things. There's eight things. Number one is pride slash selfishness. Pride and selfishness. Wanting your way will will destroy your fellowship. It'll destroy that common sharing, that like-minded common bond that we are to have. It will destroy it from the inside out. It will destroy it. Number two, apathy. Apathy usually comes by getting comfortable in the kingdom. You like what you have. You're okay with the way that things are. 
It doesn't bother you that you're really not growing and stretching and winning souls to Jesus and you're comfortable. And so it brings this spirit that you have your pew and you have your time of worship and you have your friends and your preacher and your songs that you like and your temperature of the building. And I want to keep everything that way. That spirit destroys fellowship because the fellowship of believers are those who are okay with change because growth brings change. It brings new people. It brings brokenness. It brings people who are suffering and hurt and that changes um, the worship services oftentimes. It changes the way we have to do things. Well, yeah, we still abide by the truth, but when you bring broken people, broken people in and help them heal and help them be transformed in, in the, you know, uh, in the spirit of Christ, then you, you can't have apathy. You can't just be satisfied with the way that things are. Okay. And so comfort brings disconnectedness and it leads to apathy. So pride slash selfishness, apathy. Number two, a lack of love. In other words, truly being in love with lost people and saved people and the body of Christ and loving the church because you value what you love. And if you truly can't love one another and love the people of God and love the world, in other words, love the lost, I don't mean the things of the world, but love the lost, then you won't value the, the fellowship. Okay. Let's see, number four, independence. An attitude of independence makes everything about you and about your abilities, about what you want to do and that you can do it by yourself and about your own strength. And that's not how a body works. When you take a body and... What if the arm says, you know, I don't want to be a part of this body anymore. I want to do my own thing. That doesn't work. It can't work. The arm doesn't work. The body doesn't work right. Independence. It's interdependence. So we are connected to one another. We rely on one another. We draw strength from one another. And we help one another. Okay. Number five. Habitual sin. It's practicing sin. It's what John talks about in 1 John, especially chapters 3 for chapter five, habitual sin kills and divides. It's the same way with the Israelites. It's the same way with us. That's why we have 1 Corinthians 5 in our book to deal with habitual sin. It will destroy the fellowship of like-minded believers. It'll bring division is what it will do. Okay, number whatever we're on, five, six, maybe fear. Fear brings paralysis. All the what ifs will rule your life and your relationships. It will rule your leadership and it'll make um, the fellowship and relationships superficial and shallow. Fear will. Because then you're just keeping things as they are. You're not willing to do things to reach your neighbors and to talk to people and to engage the loss because you're always afraid of what, what could happen. And then we're not being like Jesus. Okay, the next two or the last two is hypocrisy. Hypocrisy will destroy the fellowship of God. Hypocrisy, being a hypocrite causes hurt, mistrust, discouragement, and division. And then being too busy. I hope that all of us have seen in these five weeks that maybe we've been too busy doing things that don't really matter. I hope we've seen that. I hope we've learned a good lesson. I have. Have you? You see, being too busy with your work, with sports or all these different activities that school brings on or what the world expects of us or whatever it is. You can be busy doing all kinds of stuff. It brings stress, it brings fatigue, and it brings disconnectedness. 
and it hurts the body of Christ. It hurts the fellowship. It hurts quinonia because then I don't have the strength, the energy to be able to go serve, to be able to go to worship, to be able to Bible study, to be able to encourage, to be able to write letters, uh, cards, to be able to reach out to people, to be able to go to lunch with others, to be an encouragement. All these things, we can't do these things if we're too busy doing other things that in the end, maybe maybe they don't even matter. Okay, I want you to take some discussion time now that we're about done. And here's what I would like for you to do. I'd like for you to take the last uh, or the next five or 10 minutes after we say our prayer and take that together. It might be that you just write some things down. If you're alone, that's great, that's fine. Just write some things down meditate on these things. Think about these things. If you're with your family, throw these questions out here and discuss some of these things or maybe one of these questions that I'm gonna to pose to you so that we can improve um, our fellowship with the church. What is in the way in your life? What's, in other words, what's hindering you to be a more vital part of the fellowship of Christ? Have, uh, here's another question. Have you been in denial or making excuses for not doing your part in the fellowship of believers? Um, I, I am amazed at how many excuses that we come up with as Christians to not be together. And now we sit here going, I can't wait to be back together. Let's keep, let's keep this inside of us. Okay, here's another question. Are you, connect, are you truly connected to the fellowship or are you just playing church? I'm saddened by how offended some brothers and sisters get when we don't even know where they live, where they work, or about their families because all they do is come and sit on the pew on Sunday morning and head right to the car right after prayer. And yet they get offended because we didn't hear the news about something that happened in their family or, or we don't know things about their family or about them or what they've been through, what they're going through, that they're gonna have surgery or whatever, that their family member is sick or whatever it is. And yet all they do, and you go, yeah, but Steve, you don't understand what it means to be an introvert one little thing that most people in this audience that you're or the participants tonight don't know is that i used to be an introvert <laughs> I, I i know what that looks like i know what that means i didn't want to be around people see we grew, we, we, we have to grow in that and that's not an excuse god made you whether you're an extrovert or an introvert to be a part of the fellowship of believers. It doesn't mean you have to be the life of the party. It doesn't mean you have to be the one telling the story. It doesn't mean you have to be the one leading the group or leading the, what, the discussion, but you need to be a part of it. You need to be a part of it. We cannot be playing church. We must be involved and a part of the fellowship, the koinonia. Okay, here's another question to ask. Are you letting past disappointments or past hurt determine your involvement? If so, let me ask you this. Do, do the fellowship, be a part of the fellowship for Jesus, not for that past, not for that elder or for that deacon that hurt your feelings or for the preacher that didn't come and see you or for a member who, who stabbed you in the back or whatever happened. Don't let past discouragements, disappointments, or whatever it is determine your involvement in the fellowship of Christ. Another question, are you doing your part? Are you an, are you an active part of the body of Christ? And lastly, are you waiting around for the right people to finally ask you to be a part? See, I think in the book of Acts, I don't think those people waited around. I think they were just, they just jumped right in. They loved Jesus so much and what had been done for them on the cross that they just jumped right in. They took personal initiative to be a part of the fellowship of Christ. 
Let, let's be that way. Let's be that way. And your life will be more balanced and be enriched and you will grow and you will stretch and you will be doing things that you never thought you would be able to do. Listen, thank you so much for joining us tonight. I want to pray with you and I want to pray for you. And I want to ask that you pray for me, pray for my family and pray for each other. Please, please, please uh, make a prayer list and be praying for the fellowship. Be praying for the church that we may be back together in a healthy way very soon. I can't wait for that day. Thank you for joining us tonight. I love you. And I can't wait for next week as we put that last spoke in there and talk about it. And it'll be a challenging one. And so please be back for that. And of course, hope to get to see you and hope you tune in on you know Sunday on the Lord's Day for our 930 Bible class and our 1030 worship. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the church. Thank you so much, Father, for the opportunity of being a part of something so special and so sweet. Father, we really miss one another. And doing a lesson like this, it brings those emotions up, Father. We want to be together. We long, we have a longing to greet one another again, to hug one another, to shake hands, to be in the same room, Father, singing praises, calling out to you in prayer, studying in our Bibles together, being challenged by the word. Father, communing together, gathering around the table and thinking about and expressing the Lord's death and giving and just being a part, Father, of common sharing a like-minded fellowship that we're in the same cause and we're going to the same place. And Father, we await that place. We await heaven. We, we long to be with you soon. And we love you, Father. And I pray for all those listening tonight. I pray for your church worldwide, Father. Help your church to be strong. Help your church to be a light. Help us, Father, as your church to make a difference and to win souls because of this um, crisis that we're in. Father, we pray for all those that are suffering, all those that are struggling, all those that are helping others to heal and to come back to normal. We love you. Please give us wisdom. Help us to have a great week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good night.